Welcome to the seventh lecture for regulatory frameworks for environmental management and planning. Today we're looking at environmental harm and pollution. And you recall that in the last couple of lectures when we've looked at mining and coal seam gas, we've been looking at environmental authority that are required for mining and for petroleum activities under the Environmental Protection Act. And I've said we'll deal with the Environmental Protection Act in lecture seven. So uh, today we're focusing on the Environmental Protection Act, particularly in relation to its general offence provisions, uh, as opposed to um, the, we'll deal with the environmental relevant activities in passing, but it's a sort of chicken and an egg problem um, of dealing with the act first or mining coming first. So I wanted to, to get onto mining and coal seam gases just for their approval processes, and you, you tend to think of them in those sort of sectors. So this is a follow-up, but an integral component of the management of mining coal seam gas, but activities impacting on the environment generally, so a really important topic for wherever you work in environment, the environmental sphere, whether you are a consultant or working for government, the Environmental Protection Act imposes some general duties that are really important to understand. So that's what I want to try and um, get across today. And I've given you a couple of handouts we'll come back to. I want to outline the structure of the lecture slightly differently to how I've done it in previous lectures. So we're still using the problem solving approach of having a problem and then working through um, answers that would arise in solving the problem. But I want to just be clear that I'm breaking this lecture into two parts because there's no one problem that um, lets me deal with the core concepts as, um, as well as the approval process because the core concepts really come out in prosecutions and the approvals effectively give you a defence to um, a prosecution for causing unlawful environmental harm, unlawful serious or material environmental harm. So we're going to look at a problem for the bulk of the lecture involving, uh, it's a small pollution incident in, in Townsville. It uh, was something that I dealt with when I worked for the Department of Environment back in 1999 when I just graduated from um, here as a science student and a, as a law student. And so I went up and worked for the Department of Environment up in Townsville and one of the cases I dealt with, I've got some pictures and it's just a really good illustration of the core concepts of the Act. I was involved in the administration, I was an enforcement officer for the Department of Environment enforcing the Environmental Protection Act and the case comes from that. It's a small scale thing but it, it's I think just really good for teasing out the Act. Uh, in the last sort of 20 minutes or so of the lecture, I'll, I'll recap on the EPA approval processes and other tools, um, but we've looked at where it is really significant um, in relation to mining and petroleum. Um, also mentioned environmentally relevant activities generally for activities like waste disposal and the like, so I'll touch on those. Uh, contaminated land and executive <coughs> officer liability as well, and I've given you some handouts on that. So the Environmental Protection Act, um, is the focus of the lecture. And I really want to get across to you the key definitions and core concepts in the Act. Ideas like environmental values, environmental harm, um, the general environmental duty, and then also some of the important planning and management tools that the Act creates, like um, the approval processes for environmental relevant activities, contaminated land, and, and the like. I just note that the Act doesn't deal with ship sourced pollution, so that's dealt with under separate legislation, the Transport Operations in brackets Marine Pollution Act, which very rarely, relatively rarely gets used. Um, it, you know, I won't worry about ship sourced pollution. The Environmental Protection Act is generally applied to land sourced pollution, even if, even if it affects the marine environment. It's sometimes been applied to ships. Um, but mainly when the transport operations legislation was just inadequate for the penalties that could be imposed. So that big pollution incident that occurred a couple of years ago involving that, remember that container that breached the hull of a ship and there was some oil that spilt and affected um, Morton Island, North Stradbroke Island and the Sunshine Coast and there was a big clean-up effort about three years ago. That was, they were prosecuted under the Environmental Protection Act but it was mainly because the EP Act has uh, had better um, offence provisions. Generally, though, it's mainly land source pollution that it's used for. 
Before I get onto that, though, I want to set the context um, a bit wider than I'm focusing in on this little problem in Townsville. It's relatively little, but I'm using it to just tease out the concepts in the Act. Pollution, though, is obviously a really important component of environmental regulation, or avoiding pollution is a really important component of environmental regulation. And a lot of people, when they think about environmental law or environmental regulation, they would immediately think about a pollution like oil spills or the like. And I hope one of the things you take from this course is that actually environmental regulation is a lot more than that. Through the group assignment, you're looking at either the, the development of the site up at Inskip, either under the planning legislation or the mining legislation, and you'll see that environmental impacts are a really important component of the approval processes. And um, so planning and mining regulation is important for environmental regulation generally, and that can deal incidentally with pollution, like from soil erosion sediment con control. Um, and we don't tend to use the term pollution in the Queensland environmental legal system, but um, I want to just draw that out through this lecture. But let's start with a high-end pollution incident, something that's still ongoing and affecting Sydney. And then I'll just mention a couple of other examples of stories of the importance of pollution controls. The story that I want to focus on as a preliminary topic is the story of dioxin contamination on Sydney Harbour. So I didn't even know that Sydney Harbour was quite heavily contaminated until 2010. I was going through Sydney um, with my partner. We were going down to visit her folks live in um, Wollongong. We were going down for a holiday. And I just happened to see the Sydney Morning Herald. And it, this was the front page. And it really intrigued me. Um, it said across the top, the poison that got away. Harbour dioxins hit a critical level. The fishing bans in Sydney Harbour will have to stay in place for decades due to high levels of dioxins, despite an expensive clean-up of Homebush Bay, the original source of the contamination. And the story went on. I'll explain a bit more about it. Um, but I, you know, I'd been to, I'm sure everyone here has been to Sydney. And you're like, you walk down to the Sydney, you know, Circular Quay, walk around Sydney Opera House. You know, You've probably been there on a beautiful day, the sun's shining, the sailboat's out, there's ferries going, and you look at it and you think, wow, this is beautiful, you know, what a great place. And you think it, you know, with, while it's um, a city, you can look at the harbour as being quite clean, there's typically no visible rubbish. Um, and so this story really shocked me, and I dug into it further, and I've written a bit about it, and I want to tell you the story of it because it touches on a number of themes of the course and environmental regulation generally. So um, this picture is taken. Notice this person is fishing. Um, you can see the Sydney Harbour Bridge in the distance. Do you reckon that this person is fishing um, near the Sydney Opera House or upstream of the, on the other side of the Sydney Opera House? Do you reckon they're down at near the Sydney Opera House in near Circular Quay, or yeah. maybe? Yeah. Who votes for above the Sydney? And this is significant in the context of the story. You'll see in a moment why. Who reckons they're above the Sydney Harbour Bridge in terms of inland from it? Who reckons down near the Sydney Opera House? So I've got a couple, and then I'm sure there's some people don't know. In fact, the person is upriver, so inland from the Sydney Harbour Bridge. So the um, opera house is on the other side of the bridge there. And you notice that she's fishing. Um, and that's significant. I'll come back to it in a moment. Because there's, well, basically there's bans in place. Typically, technically, it's, there's commercial fishing bans for the whole of Sydney Harbour because of this dioxin and pollution. But also there's recommendations that you don't eat anything that you catch above the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And there's quite strict low levels of recommended intake of fish caught beneath the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And so this lady is um, fishing above the Sydney Harbour Bridge. That's why it was on the, that was the significance of the um, picture on the paper because they went around and basically spotted all these people fishing around in areas where the New South Wales government recommends you don't eat anything um, that's caught in those areas. And so the background is that um, there's, there were some sites 
um, in Sydney Harbour, well up in it's Port Jackson, is the I think is the name of the bay. Um, Sydney Harbour, you might think of as the like if I take you to the next picture. So um, here's the Sydney Harbour Bridge and CBD. So everyone's walked around Circular Quay here, and here's the Harbour Bridge. So um, I think the whole thing is called Port Jackson, um, but if we just think of Sydney Harbour as pretty well the whole thing, that might not technically be correct. I'm sure most people would think of it as this sort of area as being Sydney Harbour. Um, but upriver of the Sydney Harbour Bridge is this Homebush Bay site, which was polluted. And this, is the, this was a little timeline of um, its use um, that was in the Sydney Morning Herald article. Um, and actually the, the use started back in the 30s and it was used for chemical manufacture, including in the, um, interestingly, in the, during the Vietnam War, it was used for the manufacture of um, organochlorine herbicides, including 245T and Agent Orange. Um, those were the, you know, the, some of the key ingredients for Agent Orange that was used in the Vietnam War. And it's um, bitterly ironic that, you know, the poison that was, or the herbicide that was used to defoliate um, large tracts of Vietnam, so it was a, basically it was a herbicide that was put on, sprayed by the Americans across massive areas of the jungle in Vietnam to destroy the vegetation and remove the cover that the Viet Cong were using. And it caused tremendous ecological damage uh, as well as birth defects and some horrible impacts on the Vietnamese people. And um, it's ironic that we were manufacturing it and our major, our major um, city is being polluted um, in part because of that um, manufacture of the Agent Orange for the Vietnam War. Um, and well, sorry, this um, timeline goes through. It was closed in the late 80s, um, and then contaminated sediments were found. There was a ban in 1989 on fishing. Um, on commercial fishing was banned in most of Sydney Harbour in the early 1990s. They remediated the site, um, and then more tests revealed dioxins leaching into the harbour. And then in 2006, it went on. They discovered contamination across the whole harbour, and that's when the, the recommendations for not eating anything north of or west of the Sydney Harbour Bridge came into place. So the site was about 12 kilometres um, inland from the bridge, Sydney Harbour Bridge. This is a picture of it taken from the air, looking back to the CBD in the distance. So there's Sydney, and the Sydney Harbour Bridge would be about here. And so this is the site now. It's been developed for residential, Hambush Bay, you know, it was part of the site of the uh, Olympic Games in 2000, and after the Olympic Games, it's been developed for residential um, purposes. Notice that the shoreline is straight here. Um, most of that's been reclaimed, and that's part of one of the reasons the contamination occurred. This is the um, Rhodes Bay Peninsula in 1928, and basically that the shoreline is now like, I haven't done that very straight, but basically see how that was, that's sort of looking from, the next slide is sort of looking from this angle. Um, this is in 1928. And this is just some aerial shots, one in 1930. So s basically they filled in, you can see that reclamation going there, and then this is the current extent of it. So um, this is the site in 1934. It was the Trimble Chemical Company at Rhodes, and then it was bought out by Union Carbide in the 60s, and there's a major chemical manufacturing um, plant. What's Union Carbide famous or infamous for? A big disaster in India, in Bhopal, in the 1980s. There was the Bhopal gas disaster where a Union Carbide plant um, spilled chemicals out in the middle of the night and tens of thousands of people were killed uh, and many, many more maimed um, by the chemical, the gas that, fil that went from the um, Union Carbide um, factory. So it became infamous. Um, and 
they actually, anyway, it was a Union Carbide site, site at the time, and they changed their name. They had subsidiaries in many different countries. They actually changed the name of the Australian company to uh, Lednes, um, basically because Union Carbide had become a um, toxic name. So they just had the same company, they changed the name. This is a list of the sorts of things that were manufactured on the site, going from the 1920s when there were timber preservatives, a whole range of stuff. In the 50s, um, 60s and 70s, there was 245T and 245D herbicides, um, chlorine, DDT and the like. Um, the, this is the site when it's been decommissioned in 1986. Um, and then to prepare it for the residential properties that were going to be built there, they actually removed a lot of the soil and just took it away and brought in clean fill because it was so heavily contaminated. The um, site itself is here on this map. Can you see? This is a um, map. I actually got it from the Sydney Morning Herald, the paper version, and I just scanned it. Here's the Harbour Bridge. Can you see east of that. Can you just make out the harbour? It's fairly faint. So here's North Head and you know when you see the boats sail in the Sydney Hobart they sail out and go around the heads and sail south. So that's the classic Sydney Harbour. Manly's over here. Can you make that out? Okay so basically the numbers are from um, some papers by Gavin Birch and others in marine pollution and journal in 19, 2007. I could use the map that they had but it's not as um, artistic as this one so I um, wanted to use this one. And the numbers are in um, total, sorry, toxic equivalency factors from the World Health Organization. So there are a number of uh, toxins that were released from the site. Uh, some of it came when they filled in the land and they used contaminated fill but the ma a major source of them contaminating the surrounding bay was um, uncontrolled stormwater releases from the site. So that basically there would have been particles and contaminants around on the site and when rain fell on the site it just washed into stormwater systems and then flowed into the um, surrounding bay and then from there it spread out and it has basically contaminated the entire harbour. You can see that the number, so these numbers represent the toxic equivalency factors, the um, World Health Organization toxic equivalency factors. So these are incorporating a whole range of different toxins and I know our chemical engineers could probably, you could easily um, get over my head in terms of understanding the chemistry of it. I had to look up when I was researching the article, I had to look up what dioxins were and PCBs and it really stretched my organic chemistry memory from 20 years ago. Um, but basically these numbers represent a summary of all of the toxic factors um, so that you can look at them in one unit and basically you've got, um, see the high numbers around the road site, 460, 610, 520 and then the further you get away basically they drop away um, some place like it's near Seaforth or Clontarf, they're about 1.5. Manly, they're about 17, so there's variation. Um, but they're spread basically across the harbour. Gavin Birch's article in Marine Pollution basically linked it definitively to the um, Rhodes site because there was a chemical signature that they were looking at, things that were produced at the Rhodes site. They knew from the history of the site they came from there and then the chemical signature that was found at different locations and basically fingerprinted the chemical signature 20 years on. So this, the article was in 2007 and they were looking at pollution that occurred several decades ago and where did it come from given that there's a range of different industries in Sydney. So it's a, some really fascinating science um, behind this map. But basically, um, it, yeah, spread out across the harbour. And on the basis of this research, the New South Wales government recommends that you don't eat anything that's caught above the Sydney Harbour Bridge. So no fish, no mollusks, no um, prawns or crustaceans, no crabs. And beneath the Harbour Bridge that you can consume um, maximum safe monthly consumptions based on testing of specific species east of the Harbour Bridge. So kingfish 1.8 kilograms a month. 
um, sand widening 1.2 kilograms, which isn't a lot per month. Um, and my thought would be, <laughs> why the hell would you <laughs> be risking it? Um, uh, and there's no commercial fishing allowed, so that's just recreational fishers. So I, I just find this story amazing. You know, you go to Sydney, it looks like a clean harbour, and the fact that you basically fishing is banned west of the Hub Bridge, I just find it amazing. Um, the story in the um, Sydney Morning Herald also explained that the testing that had been done by the New South Wales government suggested that the bans are going to remain in place for decades because the um, toxins don't break down uh, and basically the only way they're going to drop out of the food chain is that basically more muck will come, more sediments will come and cover them in. So there's no practical way to go around the harbour and like hoover them back up. They're just sitting there on the bottom of the harbour. And so when prawns and other things, you know, microbes eat, um, uh, you know, scum and the like on the bottom of the harbour and um, through bioaccumulation, um, it gets, as you move up through the food chain, the toxins get um, accumulated uh, so that if you ultimately eat a fish, you're getting, you know, the results of thousands of microbes and prawns and things, what they have done on the bottom floor, you end up with ingesting that. Um, and there's no way to get rid of it, and it doesn't break down. So we're just going to have to wait for more sediment to come. So I find it an amazing story because there's, this, you know, millions of people living around this harbour. It looks really nice to for sailing and the like. And the takeaway lesson I think from this, actually I've, I'll just mention, I wrote a an article about um, this because I was really interested in the story. It was on the conversation, I'll put up the link for it on the website, but it, the article was um, titled Sydney's Harbour Toxic, Sydney Harbour's Toxic Legacy Shows Value of Green Safety Net because this was written back in 20, 2012 and there was a big campaign at that time by the Business Council of Australia and some governments um, to demonise environmental regulation and say they call it green tape and the whole idea with that is to say green, you know, environmental regulation is just needless bureaucracy that doesn't do anything than impose costs on industry and doesn't achieve any good outcomes and I just thought that the Sydney Harbour dioxin contamination was the bloody great story for why you need environmental regulation. So um, I'll put up the link, it goes through a few things about green tape and the like, um, the story that I've just explained to you about dioxin contamination, the history of it, links to you know what 245T and 245D are and that sort of stuff. Um, and then the toxic legacy and that it basically can't be remediated and it'll take decades to um, basically for fishing to be allowed or recommended. Um, and the key thing I wanted to say with that article is that environmental regulation is actually bloody hard. When you think about a site like this, the chemistry involved is really complex. And, a, and one of the worst contaminants that came from the production of the Agent Orange chemicals wasn't actually the herbicides themselves. There's a really nasty dioxin that's produced um, inadvertently um, as a byproduct, an unwanted byproduct from, I think it's the incomplete, it's basically um, a poorly controlled manufacture process and it was that incomplete, um, uh, the dioxin that was produced as, in, as a byproduct which was one of the most toxic and they may, might not even realise that at the time how bad it was. Um, and certainly there was a lack of management of the site in just allowing stormwater to be washed straight off site. And I think it's really easy to target you know, environmental laws and say, oh, you know, there's all this work we've got to do to comply with them, all this record keeping. But this is a really good example of why they're so important because there were lax laws that allowed that situation to fester and go on for decades. And it was really complex, but if you think about it from a regulator's perspective, it's actually really hard to monitor these sites. You, because you won't just have one of these sites. This would have been one of hundreds of different factories across the Sydney Harbour catchment, and thousands of different factories across New South Wales. So the new, you know, local governments 
too small to really deal with this stuff. The state regulators, this is one of hundreds or thousands of sites that you're regulating. It's not like you've got just staff that go out and monitor one site all the time. So you're dealing with incomplete pictures. You, you might pick up something if there's you know, a fish kill or something, but when there's a chronic accumulating pollution like this and it's basically disappearing into the harbour, it's really hard to pick that up. So talking about environmental regulations, green tape, I just think is, I tried to say, well, you should really think about it as a green safety net. It's there to protect us. And yes, there is some cost involved with it, but the flip side is that we're trying to prevent contamination events like this, which is affecting millions of people and for decades. So it's just an incredible, I think, incredible story. Um, so, in summary, I think the takeaway lesson from this is that environmental regulation is hard. Managing and regulating sites such as the former Union Carbide Factory is difficult, complex, technical and may involve activities spanning decades that cause severe cumulative impacts with long-term effects. Um, if you guys end up working for regulators or even in, as consultants, you know, these are the sorts of, s sorts of sites that you have to deal with. And so you draw upon a lot, you know, all the stuff you've learnt through your degrees, all that training, you know, all of the chemistry subjects you were forced to do because they were a core subject or whatever. Um, you know, all of that is what you need to be able to manage a site like this. And it's hard. Okay, a couple of other famous pollution incidents. Everyone knows the Exxon Valdez spill that occurred in 1989 when this massive oil tanker, um, the captain was drunk, ran it, they were going out from um, Valdez um, port in um, Alaska uh, in the early hours of morning, ran it onto a reef and massive spill occurred which affected Prince William Sound. A lot of wildlife badly affected so you know, you've seen these sorts of pictures before of major cleanup um, effects. Um, a much more recent major pollution event occurred with the BP um, Deepwater Horizon disaster in, um, was it 2011? Just a few years ago. So that's where that um, drilling rig in the Gulf of Mexico <coughs> caught fire and then basically oil kept spilling out from where they had drilled um, on the seafloor and it couldn't be shut off for several weeks. And so there was a massive oil spill event, which ultimately cost BP billions of dollars in um, fines. So this is an article um, saying BP had reached a $7.2 billion deal to settle claims from fishermen and other private claimants. And then this is an article from 2012 saying that BP had agreed to pay $4.5 billion to settle criminal charges from the spill. So, you know, 7.2, 4.5, you're looking at over, you know, what, about $12 billion worth of fines um, and costs. That's a huge amount of money. Another um, situation, I don't know the right word for it, another major pollution event that's occurring right now that's heavily in the news is the extreme pollution in China, uh, in Beijing and the cities around it. Um, you would have seen, um, and there's been a lot of coverage of it, where basically people, you can hardly breathe. The um, actual air levels are going well beyond safe levels for breathing with fine particulates. A lot of it coming from coal-fired power stations, steel production, um, coal, um, uh, heating of homes using <coughs> coal. Um, and basically going into the air shed and affecting millions of people. And just recently, as another example uh, from Townsville, actually, um, there's the toxic spill um, from Clive Palmer's Yubulu nickel refinery. So that's a picture of the Yubulu. Um, this is the nickel refinery. And there's some tailing ponds that are constructed nearby and with the recent cyclone the tailings dams filled up filled up and they spilled out and they basically um, are right next to the Great Barrier Reef. So this um, article was um, from the Australian and I normally don't read or touch the Australian. I think it's actually toxic to touch. I think they impregnate it with some sort of poison so that if you pick up a copy of the Australian 
you're, you're gradually, you're taking years off your life every time you turn a page. So I recommend never touching the Australian or reading it online. Um, but um, I just, because they were one of the, you know, they hate um, Clive Palmer with a passion and there's this fight going on between him and the Australian and News Limited. Um, I just picked the headline from their um, page, um, their story about it. Um, and the Queensland government is currently investigating and, and again there's a the politics in that because obviously there's been this huge falling out between Clive Palmer and the current Queensland government and they hate each other and so any chance to attack Clive Palmer the Queensland government seems to use and um, so there's an investigation going on right now about the tailings dams and yeah it's a big site north of Townsville. So those are all big incidents. But I want to focus on a small-scale, run-of-the-mill, everyday sort of problem that you might face as a regulator. This, um, I call it the Townsville Bitumen Primer Spill. It was in 1999, and as I said, it was something that I dealt with when I had graduated from um, here and gone up to Townsville to work for the Department of Environment. And I want to use this to bring out the key definitions and concepts, concepts in the Environmental Protection Agency. So you all know Townsville is in far north Queensland, um, really nice city. Uh, there's um, a big defence base there. It's an interesting city because there's heavy industry, there's the defence base, um, there's, that's the Yubula Nickel Refinery, the Clive Palmer's one there. Um, there's also some other refineries south of the city. There's the Port of Townsville. Um, there's some beautiful wetland areas as well. Um, it borders the Great Barrier Reef and Magnetic Island is a really fun place as well with a lot of it being National Park. Um, just focusing in on, here's the port of Townsville and some interesting mangroves. These are the Ross River and Ross Creek. I think that's the Ross River flowing there. And I'm just going to, that's Castle Hill if you've ever, anyone from Townsville by the way? Nope, okay. Well, nice city. Um, and sorry, I'm just going to focus in. You can see the incident occurred in Annandale, which is um, inland from the main city, it's a suburb of um, and you can see here, here's the river, Ross River, I think that is, um, which flows down to the bay and ultimately to the Great Barrier Reef. Notice there's this creek, this tributary coming in. That was where the pollution ultimately impacted. And I'm going to focus in on this area that is now, this is a Google Earth image, I think from 2010, and there's now houses on it. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures that are taken at street level. Um, I'll call them A and B. And basically, the pictures were taken before this suburb was built or before these houses here were built. And it involves basically the construction of what's now become this road. Um, and I'll show you some pictures involving this drain which flows down to the creek. And there's a um, sediment trap just here at area B. So um, that's the sediment trap that we'll look at. So this is what it looks like now. This is just a street view uh, image of it, um, about 2011. And this is the same, standing in virtually the same position in, to, in 1999. So you can just see that driveway. Um, that's the edge of that driveway just there. Um, so I took this picture and it shows machinery and a road that was being constructed, basically that it was being developed as a residential estate then and these pictures were taken on Monday. I'd gotten into work that said that there's a pollution spill out at Annandale. We need to go out and investigate it. The incident had been reported on the Saturday and we learnt the story. Um, we learnt the um, story when, it w when we went out um, and the, basically the story went like this. The um, company that was constructing the residential estate um, was building the roads and they, this is their machinery. They um, had a delivery of, um, so to construct the roads they, they had the bitumen delivered. But before you lay bitumen down, I didn't know this until before dealing with this incident, but um, you spray bit, what's called bitumen primer and it's as I was, what I was told was it's a 50% mix of diesel and bitumen like the tar and it, the tar just 
basically makes the bitumen less viscous so that when you spray it down it soaks in, my, idea, my understanding is it soaks into the soil uh, and then when the bitumen goes on top of that it's got something better to bind to rather than just going on bare soil. So um, that's what the bitumen primer is, diesel and bitumen, um, but it's more of a fluid than bitumen itself. And so they were wanting to construct this road that obviously used the rollers and everything to roll the, the um, road flat. The driver who delivered it, was it, they were contracted to do it, I think it was CSR was the company at the time. The driver said to the foreman for the company that was building the road, he said that he was worried um, because there was heavy rain about. It was actually the wet season and if you've been to North Queensland in the wet season, if you get a big downpour, you can have really heavy rain. So it was the wet season, there were really dark clouds about and he said to the foreman, you know, you know, should we pour? There's, um, you know, there's a lot of rain about. Um, the foreman said, no, no, um, we're behind schedule. We need to get on with this. We want to pour. So he started pouring and he's poured about five or six hundred litres of the bitumen primer. I think pretty well this whole section of road that you can see there that's a bit blackened. And anyway, after he poured that, um, the heavens opened and it just bucketed with rain. And so basically they realised there wasn't going to be more work that day. So they all basically shut down the machinery, jumped in their utes and headed off the site. Um, so no one was on site, um, but the heavy rain made the bitumen primer lift back up and it flowed then into the drain and then around the corner. And that's our inspector's hat there, just for an idea of scale. You can see the residue just left there. And it flowed into this um, drain which then flowed into the um, stormwater system that flowed north across the site. And you can see the residue that's been left. Of, you know, obviously, there was a, quite a bit of water moving down there um, on the Saturday. Um, this, these pictures have been taken on the Monday after it. You can see the sediment fences that are there. Um, and then it flowed down. This is the end of the drain at area B that I mentioned before with the sediment basin that they've constructed to slow down water before it enters the creek. And you can see the residues there of the bitumen primer. These white little pads were um, from the, um, basically the cleanup. I'll just explain to you what happened. So they left the site and um, what happened then was one of the neighbours saw black tarry stuff going into the creek and called up our departmental hotline for pollution incidents. Our inspector went out, um, John, um, and the fellow whose hat you saw, and um, he was able to identify the company that was responsible for the site from signage on the property. He called them um, and said, you know, you've got, um, there's um, black um, tar coming off your site. They then responded by getting all of their workers back to the site. Um, they raced off to the port of Townsville. They didn't have any cleanup equipment, but they raced off to the port of Townsville, which is, you know, just a few k's down the road which has a heap of clean-up equipment, they were able to borrow or, you know, get a loan of um, um, clean-up equipment and they raced back to the site and that's what these absorbent pads are. Um, and then um, here you can see another angle of the sediment basin um, and this is um, some of their workers and they've got these absorbent booms. This is the creek a little bit downstream. You can see it's not a pristine creek. There's a road, ugly road going across it that isn't, hasn't been well constructed. There's rubbish in it. Can you see there just that film of black over there on the bank? That's the residue of the tar that would have been, it would have been flowing really hard. Um, here's some of the workers putting down the absorbent booms. Now I'd like you to note in this picture the incredibly high standards of workplace health and safety displayed by the company. Notice the protective boots um, to, you know, this is a, a creek with a lot of rubbish in it, you know, you'd expect broken bottles and the like. So they've got on their protective boots to stop any contact with, you know, harmful objects, the oil and the like, um, the gloves that they're wearing, the goggles, the hard hats, um, all of that protective equipment. So they're obviously, a, you know, a high-end um, company that's, you know, completely into workplace health and safety. Seriously though, um, joking aside, what does this picture tell us about the standards in the company? Yeah. They weren't, they weren't prepared, but I don't know if you go, I'm from North Queensland, so 
they're just a pretty, they're a pretty standard small company, like you get with lots of farmers. They're not, you know, they, they know their job well, like I'm sure all of these guys, you know, if they're a bulldozer driver, they're a good bulldozer driver. Um, but, you know, they're not, um, what's that line from Shrek? They're not the sharpest tool in the shed. Um, they're ordinary community people who do their job, go home to their kids, don't really, you know, they're concerned about the environment, but from, you know, the fact that they go fishing on the weekend, they don't know anything about the Environmental Protection Act. They know that probably that you shouldn't pollute the environment. They know that there's regulators around and they're in, the company's in trouble, so that's why they're doing a cleanup. But they don't understand any of the higher level concepts. They're just ordinary people. Um, and a lot of, as a regulator, you're then reacting to the level of, you know, you also know the level of companies and around. You've got a regulated community. You can't have unreasonable expectations or no one will meet them. So, you know, a lot of your job is about bringing up standards generally. It's not necessarily going in and shooting everyone on site for the smallest infringement. It's about going in, often working with industries to try and bring up levels of compliance um, as much through cooperation and education as through enforcement. Um, but this is, you know, just a typical sort of situation. It's far from unusual that um, smaller companies might have pretty low standards generally. Um, any questions on the problem, the situation? So um, we rocked up on Monday. They were already into cleanup. Um, the question I want to pose, I want us to take the regulator's perspective. So just imagine you are in the position I was in. You've graduated, you're working for the Department of Environment Heritage Protection, say, you know, you know, it could be in Brisbane, any, anywhere around Queensland. Um, let's look at what offence, if any, has the company committed and how can a regulator, that's us, respond to the situation? So we need to look at the Environmental Protection Act and um, we need to understand the core concepts in it um, before we can really form a view on whether an offence has been committed or not. And I... You know, we could go to the legislation website and download it, um, but can I just say I've already done that and, and I, know I don't want to go over really basic things with you guys. So let's just take one of the versions I've downloaded. I've given you a handout um, with the Environmental Protection Act on it. Um, we could skim read through it. We find, you know, I, I think I did this in the mining chapter, so there's preliminary, chapter two, chapter two deals with environmental protection policies, um, chapter three, in environmental impact statements, chapter four, a great barrier reef protection measures. Um, you know, we might go and look at that, but we'd find that it deals with agricultural activities, not these sorts of activities. So even though they're in the catchment of the GBR, that part isn't relevant. Chapter four, a chapter five deals with environmental authorities. Um, chapter 5A deals with general provisions about environmental authorities. Chapter 7, there's no chapter 6, just to make it interesting, because we can't count. Um, so there's no chapter 6. Chapter 7 deals with environmental management, and there's a whole range of things we find in there. There's things like the general environmental duty in section 319, a um, whole range of duties to notify. Um, there's environmental evaluations. Um, basically, we could, as a regulator, we could order um, an entity to conduct an environmental evaluation. Um, there's a whole heap of things, special provisions, temporary emissions licenses, environmental protection orders. And basically, you start to get confused, I think, at about this point. You think, well, gee, there's all these things in it. Um, chapter 8 deals with general environmental offences. We'll come We find that there's some general offences for causing a person must not willfully and unlawfully cause serious environmental harm. And 438, a person must not willfully cause material environmental harm. So what are they? We'll have to find that out. And we go on, there's chapters on investigation and enforcement. That's important for us as a regulator. It gives us a whole range of powers to go onto a site, question people, ask for documents and the like. 
we've got emergency powers, so if there's an emergency, we can order people to do things, like the nickel refinery, there could be emergency orders made to release or not to release some contaminant. Um, there's offences for failing to comply with those things. There's legal provision, sorry, legal proceedings in Chapter 10. Chapter 11 deals with administration and the like. Chapter 12 deals with a whole lot of miscellaneous things. And there's a Chapter 13, which is really long, dealing with savings transitional provisions. And then we also could go and look at the regulations. We find that there's a important provisions in the regulations dealing with, for instance, environmentally relevant activities. But that's a skim read of the Act. I've given you a handout with a simplified structure of the Act because, can you just take that out? Um, and can I just explain a bit of background? I think I started to do it in looking at the Mineral Resources Act. Basically, this Act has been chopped and changed dramatically over the last 20 years since it was enacted. It was originally quite a simple Act. And then there were some big changes to it. First in 1998, when it was integrated into the IDAS system, so we had this system for environmental licensing for environmentally relevant activities when it was first created. And um, the planning department wanted to integrate that first into the IDAS system under the Integrated Planning Act at the time. And so they pushed it in. And I remember working for the Department of Environment at the time, and it was a nightmare trying to work out how we were supposed to now license activities. Um, a lady called Beverly Hommel, who's a solicitor who works for Brisbane City Council, wrote an article at the time um, in the Environmental Planning Law Journal about the integration, and she said, the integration of the Environmental Protection Act into the IDAS system has changed a coherent system for ongoing environmental licensing um, and management into a minefield of complexity and uncertainty. And I really agreed with her at the time. It was really difficult. Um, and then in 2000, the government decided that it wanted to beef up the regulation of mining. And I mentioned in the lecture on mining that they decided to split more clearly the promotion of mining and royalties um, in the Department of Mines and the regulation of mining for environmental issues um, into the Department of Environment or the Environmental Protection Agency at the time. And to, when they did that, they also beefed up the Environmental Protection Act and they changed a lot of things around in the Act. And I sort of, you can sort of think about the structure of the Act like this. Imagine that you took um, 800 pages of legislation and you ripped it apart at the spine and then you threw it all in the air and then it just came down randomly and you pushed it all back together and then got out a big staple gun and went kadunk, kadunk, kadunk. There you've got the Act. It's pretty well what the Act look like, looks like now. It's like it's been randomly stapled together. Maybe a bit of an overstatement, but <laughs> only a slight one. Um, in 2013, the, the severely bloody compromised Act, um, in terms of just conceptually, it changed from a conceptually coherent Act into this thing that sort of had bits all over the place. Um, the Act in 2013, had these chapter headings. And then there was this green tape reduction bill that Labor first proposed and then the current LNP government took over when it got into power. I've already said I hate the green tape term. I think it's a complete misnomer that's meant to denigrate environmental regulation, which is really important part of the safety net that protects the community. Um, so green tape, I really dislike. I prefer, I would you know, rather it be called, you know, green, we call it the green safety net, because that's what I think environmental regulation is. Sure, you want it to be as efficient as possible, but at the end of the day, it's there to protect the community. And a lot of sites are really difficult, require a lot of ongoing record keeping. That's just the reality of um, proper management of complex sites. But anyway, that act, prior to that act coming in, there was environmental approvals were broken up into a number of different chapters and basically what they did was merge that all, all into one chapter. So chapter four used to deal with development approvals under the IDAS system. Chapter five dealt with environmental authorities for mining activities and chapter 5A dealt with environmental authorities for petroleum activities and coal seam gas storage. Um, and, and as an example, can I just mention, so when you look at old, um, not, not, old not even that old approvals, but um, 
Um, so this is, last week we talked about the petroleum approvals for the, that GLNG project. This is one of the approvals for under the Environmental Protection Act. And can you see there it's got Level 1 Environmental Authority, Chapter 5A Petroleum Activity. So that's referring to the old chapter um, numbers and it used to be called Level 1 Environmental Authorities. That no longer exists. And they've also got a range of environmental authorities that no longer and similarly no longer exist. I'll talk in a moment about the um, development approval for the Rochdale landfill when we talk about, uh, and we're going on a field trip to this site, but this is the decision notice for it. Um, and here's the permit um, for chemical storage, which, which no longer exists as a, sorry, that environmental authority. Um, what's the ERA for that one? What did I put? Hmm. I can't see my, the other environment. There's another environmental authority that we'll look at. Just basically that these licenses you, you look at, oh, here it is, example. Um, so this is for Rochdale, um, and this is the one that's still in force for Rochdale, and we'll look at on the field trip. You can see there it refers to a section under the Integrated Planning Act, which hasn't been in force for years. It also refers to an ERA 75B4, which is now ERA 60. So you get, it's actually quite complicated looking at these licenses because they might have been granted in, in years past under a different system and you've got to understand the old terminology to an extent. Um, so the transition on saving provisions are actually quite um, a significant part of it. But that was what it looked like, the old structure, and now we've gotten rid of several chapters and basically now there's just a single chapter dealing with environmental authorities. It still deals with things under IDAS, it still deals with mining and petroleum activities, it's just that they're now under one chapter um, and now, sorry, the, this is, I think I pointed this out, but it really <laughs> annoys me that they used to have a chapter 5A and 6, 6 was general provisions and now they've changed general provisions into 5A and there's no 6. I just, you know, are they like stupid or what? Like you'd think that someone in bloody government, it was, this is going through parliament, might point out, you know, why don't we keep 6? Because that's what comes after 5 and before 7. You know, it's, it's that difficult. So, but anyway, we've got a chapter 5A and no 6. Um, so that's the structure as it is now. I don't think the green tape reduction actually simplified too much, it just basically merged things into one chapter, but the guts of the Act is still there. Um, can we look at the core concepts of the Act? So I've given you this handout. The Act, as I said, looks like someone ripped it apart, threw it in the air and stapled it back together randomly, um, but if you look at this handout, If you think of the Act as having an object at the top of protecting the environment while allowing for ecologically sustainable development, that's what we're trying to achieve. And you as a regulator, that's your goal. There's some key definitions that are central to the operation of the Act, and I'll look at them in a moment. There, um, I've set, set them out on the reverse of the handout for you. Um, so the definition of an environment, environmental value, environmental harm, material environmental harm, and serious environmental harm. Then there's a core concept, this relationship between what's the general environmental duty and unlawful environmental harm, which is in, you can see they're well in the back of the Act, but to me this is the core of the whole Act in section 319 and section 493, capital A. And then the Act basically creates a whole range of tools that you as a regulator, the state government, can use to protect the environment. So there's things like environmental protection policies, which back in 1994 it was an idea that we would that they would go out and consult with the community and they would develop a whole heap of standards. The idea for EPPs pretty well died with the administration. There's EPPs for water, noise, air, waste, but they're, they're not that significant. Um, 
the original idea would have been, you know, much more extensive setting of environmental standards in EPPs. There's an environmental impact statement which is mainly used for smaller mines. So if it's a mine but you declared a coordinated project, the EIS process is done under the State Development Public Works Organisation Act. And this act, as we've talked about in previous lectures, isn't used for development under the Sustainable Planning Act. It's only used for mining and petroleum and then only the small ones. Um, environmentally relevant activities in Chapter 5 basically deals with licensing and approvals of activities that could impact on the environment and release contaminants. There's environmental evaluations and audits. Um, the regulator can give orders, call environmental protection orders, requiring companies to do certain things. Um, they can also, for a site that might cause harm and then the company might go bankrupt, like a big mine, they can require a financial assurance. So, you know, if they think that it's going to cost a million dollars to rehabilitate the site, they might say, we want a million dollars put in a bank account as a financial assurance. And so that's, there's a whole provision on contaminated land management which basically is a registry of sites that may or are known to be contaminated by hazardous contaminants. So typically old factories, old petrol stations, um, sites that have been previously used for cattle dips. There's a whole range of things um, that might lead to something being listed on the CLR and the EMR. Um, there's a range of environmental offences that mentioned um, investigative powers, civil enforcement, and some public reporting. There's a requirement to produce a state of environment report. So think of these things as like just all tools that the state regulators can use to protect the environment. What I want to focus on is the environmental offences and thinking about our um, the company that is um, this bitumen primer spill in Townsville. Um, it's right on five o'clock, so why don't we take a break and we'll come back and we'll talk about the uh, offence provisions with reference to this company in Townsville. So, so five minutes. Welcome back to the second half of our lecture on the Environmental Protection Act, environmental harm. We're working our way through um, dealing with a problem involving a bitumen primer spill in Townsville and we're looking at the key definitions and concepts in the Environmental Protection Act. So, and we've just gotten up to, we have skimmed through the Act, we're going to look at some of the core concepts. So, and we're looking at that handout. So let's just have a look at the Act. If you turn over the page on the handout, you'll see some definitions. But I'll look at those definitions in the actual legislation. So section 8 of the Environmental Protection Act defines environment very widely to include ecosystems and their constituent parts including people and communities, all natural and physical resources, the quality, etc. This definition has been widely adopted. It was created for the Environmental Protection Act. It's used in the Sustainable Planning Act. It's used in the Commonwealth Environment Protection Biodiversity Conservation Act. It's been copied by many different environmental statutes in the last 20 years. And it arose out of a court case actually involving um, a case uh, about compensation for a refusal or changes to planning controls at Mon Repos um, near Bundaberg, where there's an important turtle rookery. Some of you guys might have been up to the turtle rookery at Mon Repos, so at Bundaberg. And basically, a developer was suing the council for compensation for um, uh, changes to the planning scheme restricting development. And the council argued that, that they probably wouldn't have been able to develop the land anyway because of the environmental constraints. And the council was able to consider adverse impacts on the environment. And the developer argued that environment didn't include the turtles, that environment was only the physical environment, the um, water, the land, the rocks, but not animals. Um, and it ultimately went all the way to the High Court. And the High Court said, well, actually, the turtles are part of the environment, and therefore... Um, but the legislature um, responded to this case with this very expansive definition of environment. 
But it's only the foundational concept because um, the term environment is then adopted in the definition of environmental value, which is a quality or physical characteristic of the environment that is conducive to ecological health or public amenity or safety. So it can also be defined in environmental protection policy or regulation, and there are some um, things in that, like identifying the um, qualities of water that allow it to be used for drinking, um, that allow it to be used for watering crops or um, watering stock, um, or for, um, the, for ecosystem services. Um, there's a range of noise ones, so if, um, but they're not fully fleshed out. Think about the first part of it, a quality or physical characteristic of the environment that's conducive to ecological health or public amenity or safety. And think about, say, this lecture theatre. And think about the qualities of it that's conducive to our amenity in terms of studying. What do you think is like good um, in, in terms of this lecture theatre? The qualities, the environmental qualities here. It's, what about noise? It's very quiet, isn't it? If there was a building site outside, or if there was a noisy um, group of people outside making, you know, laughing and shouting and whatever, waiting to go into a lecture, it would impact on the qualities of this room for um, studying and learning. Similarly, you know, you can take a deep breath, and you know, air is nice and clean. Um, if this lecture room was filled with smoke or dust, it wouldn't be very conducive to, you know, us sitting here and thinking about um, you know, uh, having a lecture. So noise, dust, um, particles, odours in the air. So if there was a really smelly, you know, if the sewer was broken and this um, whole lecture room just reeked of sewage, it wouldn't be pleasant at all. So um, we don't have any um, nasty smells. So all of those things are conducive to the amenity of this lecture room. So um, the amenity just means the general goodness or um, well-being um, of a site, um, for the pleasantness of an area. So public amenity includes things like any quality or characteristic of a site that, you know, in terms of, you know, not intrusive noise, um, no smells, no, um, of, you know, nothing that intrudes upon um, the pleasantness of it for its use and enjoyment. Um, but also includes ecological health. So what are the sorts of qualities or characteristics that are conducive to ecological health, do you think? So you might say, what, what are the, what's a physical characteristic of a, say, a f um, so think of the creek that we are looking at for the, um, you know, that this bitumen primer has gone into. It's a little creek, um, got mangroves along it with some um, grasses. There's some rubbish in it, but um, it's connected to a larger river system with mangroves, which flows out to the to the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area. So what, are, what do you think the values of that creek are in terms of its character, physical characteristics that are conducive to ecological health? Water yeah, water quality that animals can live in. So freedom from pollution in the water. Yeah, enough water, although if it was going up and down naturally, like if it was tidal, that actually might just be a quality or characteristic itself. Um, so interfering with that, you know, the tidal, like if you put a barrage at the front and interfered with the natural ebb and flow of the tides, that itself might be environmental harm. Um, what do you think of the mangroves provide for, say, fish? Habitat, yep, for breeding. So the little fish get in around the roots and they eat things, but also they hide from bigger fish. Um, so there's habitat. There's biodiversity in the creek itself. So biodiversity is a quality or physical characteristic of the environment that's conducive to ecological health. So if you remove, like kill a lot of things, um, that's affecting the environmental values of the creek. But it's not the creek itself, it's not the mangroves itself 
they're actually the environment, it's the qualities that they represent. That's environmental value. There's some definitions of contamination and the like, but the Act it doesn't really use them. It is all based around environmental harm, which is, I've also given this to you on your handout, environmental harm is any adverse effect or potential adverse effect, whether temporary or permanent and of whatever magnitude, duration or frequency on an environmental value and includes environmental nuisance. And it may be caused um, by an activity whether the harm is a direct or indirect result of the activity and whether the harm results from the activity alone or from the combined effects of the activity and other activities or factors. So let's think about it, an adverse effect on an environmental value. So in terms of um, the um, creek with this pollution going into it, would you be happy to accept that that bitumen primer is going to impact on things like the fisheries resources, um, the biological integrity, the biodiversity in the creek. It's going to kill some things. It's going to interfere with the habitat values of it. It's also going to make it you know, less conducive for you know, just for general ecological function. Do you ha would you be happy to accept that that would be the impact of the bitumen primer going in? Can I just point out that it's any adverse effect? So it doesn't have to come from a contaminant. It could be that if we got and dug out the creek and turned it into a canal and removed all the mangroves, that would also be environmental harm because we'd be removing habitat, we'd be causing a lot of the same impacts. Land clearing can cause environmental harm. Um, activities like fishing can cause environmental harm because you're taking out biodiversity from an, an area, particularly if, you, like if you're trawling or something and you damage the environment as you do it. So any activity can cause environmental harm and it's really wide. It includes the direct and indirect result of the activity. So would you say the bitumen primer going into the creek was a direct result of the activity or an indirect result? So they, they, their activity was to spray the bitumen primer. They didn't put it in the creek. They put it on the road. The rain then came and lifted it up and it went into the road. Do you think that they are directly responsible or indirectly responsible? Probably a nice... You know, ethical, you could have a philosophical argument about it. It doesn't really matter because it can be either of those. Um, and it doesn't matter that there's already harm to the creek or if there was other pollution incidents affecting it because it can result from, you know, this might be um, a cumulative impact with other impacts and other pollutants in the creek, but that doesn't matter because... Um, environmental harm can be caused by this activity and other activities working together. So it's a really wide um, definition. Environmental nuisance is, so I should just say, environmental harm is the um, catch-all, but there's no offence for itself just causing environmental harm. So if I, for instance, the mosquito flew into this lecture theatre and landed on me and I went and swatted it, have I caused environmental harm? I've killed a mosquito, That's, I've damaged the biodiversity of the local mosquito population. Did it, the genetic diversity of mosquitoes is now minus one member. Would you agree that I've caused environmental harm? It's any adverse effect. You happy that I've caused environmental harm? Yep. Okay, but that's not, that's not itself an offence. There's, an of there's offences around environmental nuisance, which is normally a, a temporary interference with an environmental value. Um, it doesn't say temporary, but that's generally the way it's interpreted. So fumes, odours, particles, things, um, you know, playing loud, you know, loud music or machinery operating at 6 a.m. on a work site, you might regard as environmental nuisance. Um, but the main offences are around causing material and serious environmental harm. And what these offences or what these definitions do is they create a threshold. You might think of environmental harm as a spectrum going all the way from nothing and maybe at the lowest level you might have, you know, stepping on an ant or um, squatting a mosquito. You're causing environmental harm but um, it won't be an offence against the Act because it has to be material or serious environmental harm. The first um, th the definition of material environmental harm is environmental harm other than environmental nuisance, 
that is not trivial or negligible in nature, extent, or context. So would you agree me swatting a mosquito or stepping on an ant is trivial or negligible in nature, extent, or context? Okay, so I haven't caused material environmental harm if I did that. What about um, the bitumen primer? Do you reckon that that is trivial going into that creek which flows out to the Great Barrier Reef? Do you think that, the, and you saw the pictures of it coating the sides of the um, creek, um, but it occurred during a flood event, so you know a lot of it just washed out to sea, which would be dispersed. It went down to the port of Townsville, which is already you know, a bit polluted anyway. Um, do you think that that is trivial or negligible in nature, extent, or context? Who's for yes, it is trivial? Don't, don't mind if, you, like, it's a legitimate question. I'm not, if you think it's trivial, negligible, in nature, extent, or context, put up your hand. Okay, we've got one. So everyone else thinks that it gets above that? It's more than trivial? Yep. That's fine. Um, just c compare it to swatting the mosquito. So swatting the mosquito is definitely trivial. Um, this one you think is over the threshold, but there might be a lot of cases in between swatting the mosquito and this um, pollution incident that is more difficult to work out whether it's actually trivial. And you could have, um, particularly if you're trying to prove this as a criminal offence, you'd have defence attorneys arguing that if you looked at the nature, extent and context and having to prove it beyond reasonable doubt that it was actually couldn't be established that it would cause material environmental harm. So the Act gets around those sorts of smart arguments by setting up some alternatives for how you establish environmental, material environmental harm. Notice this is or. So the basic way that legislation works, if it says and, it means that you have to do both or a cumulative um, list. If it's or, it's disjunctive. It means that either of these things satisfy the definition. So if you say it's trivial or negligible in nature, extent or context, then um, if it gets above that, it's material environmental harm. Or if it causes actual or potential loss or damage to a property, to property of an amount of or amounts totally more than the threshold amount but less than the maximum amount, and we can look at the definitions. Threshold amount means $5,000. And maximum amount means the threshold for serious environmental harm, which we look in the next section, is $50,000. So causes actual or potential loss or damage to property between five and $50,000. So um, thinking of um, the mosquito, have I caused damage to property? Who owns the mosquito? Maybe the state of Queensland or maybe no one. Um, is it worth more than $5,000? No. So I'm not liable under that limb either. What about the pollution incident in this creek? Um, so it's gone into the creek. Who owns the creek? Um, it might be the state of Queensland. It might be council. Um, but what's the property damage there? Like is it above $5,000? It's actually really hard, and we'll come to clean up in a moment, that's the next section, but this is property damage. Just imagine though there was say an aquaculture farm that this had gone into and the aquaculture farm had to destroy its whole, you know, um, uh, you know, it, all of its, um, say it was breeding um, oysters or something and it had to destroy all of them and that was $30,000 worth of oysters, then you could easily say, well that has caused um, $30,000 worth of property damage and therefore it's material environmental harm. Um, then C is the cleanup one. So it's or, either property damage or that results in costs of more than the threshold amount but less than the maximum amount being occurred in taking appropriate action to prevent or minimise the harm and rehabilitate or restore the environment to the condition before the harm. So cleanup costs between five and fifty thousand dollars. So in this case, the company got out on a Saturday. They got all their workers out, thirty odd staff. And they worked on Saturday and Sunday. They went off and got all this material from the port of Townsville, which they would have no doubt had to ultimately pay for. Um, and they were still out on Monday. 
do you reckon they would have spent more than $5,000 in cleanup? Yeah, easily. Like, however you work that out with that many staff working that many hours, plus the cleanup equipment, they would have easily been in the twenty dollars or $30,000, well over $5,000 threshold. So, even if we had an argument about whether it's trivial or negligible, given that they've spent all this money on cleaning it up, and all of those costs were the sort of reasonable costs to do it, is everyone happy that we're looking at material environmental harm here, at least? Okay, then we go on to serious environmental harm, which is in section 17. Is environmental harm, <coughs> other than environmental nuisance, that is irreversible of high impact or widespread? So is this pollution to this creek, do you reckon it's irreversible of high impact or widespread? No? Everyone's shaking their heads? What about B, caused to an area of high conservation value or special significance? So you saw the creek, it was fairly degraded already. It flows to the Great Barrier Reef, but it goes through the port of Townsville anyway. By the time it gets to the Great Barrier Reef, it's going to be all of this 5,000, 500 litres of bitumen primer is going to be very diluted. Um, if we just focused on the creek and said it didn't reach the Great Barrier Reef in any real quantity, would you say that the creek was an area of high conservation value or special significance? No. Um, then there's the damage to property of more than $50,000. So if we, again, if we had the aquaculture farm and the losses were over $50,000, you could say that it was serious environmental harm um, or results in cleanup costs of over $50,000. If we estimated that their costs were $30,000, that's what we could prove as the regulator. Is everyone happy that we're looking at material environmental harm rather than serious? Yep. Okay, so um, they're the core um, offence provision. Sorry, they're the core concepts. And they're the basic things you need to understand for the whole operation of the Act, because it often refers to environmental harm. Um, if we just go to, there are some specific of offences. Um, in Chapter 8, General Environmental Offences, there's offences for causing in environmental harm, causing serious environmental harm, Section 437, and 438, causing material environmental harm. That's our, the one we're interested in. Um, a person must not willfully and unlawfully cause uh, material environmental harm. Willfully we'd find is defined as recklessly or with gross negligence. Um, but we can also charge them with causing, un simply causing, unlawfully causing material environmental harm. We don't, we don't need it to be willful and there's a lesser penalty for that. So there's a potential offence provision. Um, can I just notice, note though that there's this term unlawfully and that's important. Um, you'll see that there's a note there referring us to section 430, sorry, 493 capital A. I'll come to that in a minute. I just also point out that there's some offences relating to water contamination that used to be in the water EPP and have now moved across. We're going to look at these in the chute in a few weeks' time. But basically, if you deposit a contaminant to a water, um, you can be charged with um, basically release, releasing a prescribed water contaminant, which includes oil um, and would include the bitumen primer, releasing it to a water, which would include the creek, um, but notice here, a person must not unlawfully deposit. So again, this unlawful comes in. And we have to go to f section 493A. Um, which again is set out on your handout. I know that this is moving all around in the Act. But as I said, the Act was ripped apart thrown in the air, stapled back together, and is just basically a random assortment of concepts now. Um, again, a little bit of an overstatement, but not by much. Um, 493 capital A. Um, this section applies in relation to the following acts. An act that causes serious or material environmental harm or an environmental nuisance um, and release of water contaminants. Subsection 2 says... An act is unlawful unless it is authorised to be done under an environmental authority or a development approval. So when someone constructs a mine, like if, say, the Alpha Coal Mine gets approved and they go in and dig this massive hole in the ground, 
um, an impact on the groundwater and biodiversity and the like, they're causing serious environmental harm. But to the extent that it's authorised under the environmental authority, it's lawful. And similarly, if you develop the um, people that are developing Inskip Point, um, if, if you, you know, if your client succeeds in getting the development approval to develop Inskip Point and you clear, you know, 20 hectares of trees, you're causing environmental harm, but be, to the extent that you do it consistently with the development approval, it's lawful. So having the development approval or the environmental authority is a key um, to complying with the Act. In this case, um, the um, civil construction company involved with the development of this site, they would have had an equivalent of a development approval, but it didn't deal with um, anything. It didn't authorise them to release bitumen primer to the local river. It had conditions in it saying, you know, you have to develop in accordance with the plans. That are, it didn't authorise the release of any contaminants to the um, nearby creek. So they don't have the benefit of that subsection. But as a regulator, you also have to think there's a general defence. If they don't have a specific approval, there's a general defence of um, if they can prove that the Act was lawful apart from the Act, this Act. So... Um, their development had all relevant approvals, they can say that, but um, it's got to be, see here, it's and, so you've got to have both limbs. Um, they also complied with the general environmental duty, so it has to be lawful apart from this act and they complied with the general environmental duty. So for that, we go back to section 319. of the Act, which again is set out in your handout. And um, this section says, a person must not carry out any activity that causes or is likely to cause environmental harm unless the person takes all reasonable and practical measures to prevent or minimise the harm. It's called the general environmental duty. Um, if you, like, soon you'll be finished this course and you won't remember a hell of a lot from it, but one thing I'd really like you to try and remember is apart from the fact that you need approvals um, for ac different activities, either under the planning legislation or the mining legislation, apart from needing approvals, there's one standard that you can say to your employer if you're working as a consultant or for a mining company or whatever, one standard that is a really good one to bear in mind, it's doing everything that's reasonable and practicable to prevent or minimise harm. So that reasonable and practicable measures, it actually comes from um, the common law of negligence. That's the basic duty that you have when you're doing anything that might harm another, to take reasonable care so that you don't cause harm. So when you're driving, you know that you're supposed to keep a lookout, you're not supposed to speed. If you're not, you know, you know, you're, work, you know you're listening to your mate um, or your girlfriend on your iPhone, um, and, you know, you're talking away, you're not on hands-free, not really watching where you're going, and you run up the back of someone who stopped at a traffic light and you just didn't see them, you haven't been taking, you haven't taken reasonable care in the operation of the motor vehicle and you <coughs> can be sued for negligence. And the basic, uh, the basic thing that you've done is breached your duty to take reasonable care. The general environmental duty is taking that same duty and applying it to the environment and saying you have to do everything that's reasonable and practicable. And in deciding what's reasonable and practicable, you have to take into account the nature of the harm, the sensitivity of the receiving environment, the current state of technical knowledge, the likelihood of success, and the financial implications, so how much it costs. So it's a risk analysis weighing up you know, benefits and costs. Um, but let's think about our particular activity here. So. They're laying the, this, they want to lay this bitumen primer. What are the reasonable and practical things that they might have done to prevent the harm occurring? They could have had a look at the weather report. Great. So the, the driver of the truck that came to deliver it actually said to the foreman, you know, I'm worried about the weather. Um, there's a lot of rain about. Um, and they decided to go ahead anyway. So a reasonable thing might have been not 
to lay the bitumen primate. You know, if you if you go into a risky situation, that can be unreasonable in itself. But having decided to go ahead, it starts pouring with rain. They all pack up and leave. What could they have done that wouldn't have been expensive, but would have been sensible to do in the circumstances. Yes, one or two people to stay and what would the word be that you might call it in environmental management terms? You would be monitoring, just monitoring the situation, having someone stay there and just see, you know, that none of this flows away. Um, if they were monitoring, what could they have done to prevent it getting away? Yeah, great. They could have blocked the sewage system off. Um, so they, uh, they didn't have any equipment at the time. But what have you got here in the background? You've got a bloody truckload of earth moving equipment. They could have built a 20-foot high dam around the bloody road. Um, but simpler than that, apart from the earth moving equipment, it's flowing into this drain. It goes to this key point. They could have just blocked that off. And then it wouldn't have gotten into the drainage system and flowed down to the creek, or at least it would have been you know, much more readily contained. So if they'd done a few simple things, um, monitoring and then blocking off the drainage system, it wouldn't have cost them a lot, so the financial implications are minimal, but it would have prevented the harm occurring. Notice that they've got their sediment fences up. That's actually a reason practical measures preventing soil erosion and sediment getting into um, the creek, so that's a compliance with the GED. Um, and this big sediment basin as well is also about preventing sediment and also scouring of the creek bank from the new um, stormwater system. So that's also part of complying with the general environmental duty. And you see on a lot of work sites, just as examples of typical compliance with the GED, you know, you'll see this all over Brisbane. Um, or on a work site that you're at. You'll see sediment fences. Wherever you've got exposed earth, um, you'll see silt fences, stockpiling of soil. Um, all of those sorts of things are part of complying with the general environmental duty. Um, this sort of stuff you commonly see around work sites. Uh, often um, they're either arranged like this as a sediment trap, but also if you're at a site where there might be chemical spills, you'll see sandbags like just um, piled you know, you might see a, r a rubbish bin there um, that's got hazard, um, you know, hazmat or something, has actually already got the spill equipment there for soaking it up. Um, and they might have some sandbags lying beside the um, drainage system so that if there is a spill, you don't have to spend 10 minutes going to look for the equipment. You can just roll the sandbag on top of it. It prevents it getting into the stormwater system. You have some, you know, hazard... Um, clean up equipment readily there. Have a look next time you're on a work site and if it's a well-managed work site, that's the sort of stuff you expect to see. And that's why I say, you know, you won't remember a lot from this course, but I'd really like you to try and remember reasonable practical me measures, the general environmental duty. It's a really useful thing in your working lives to be aware of. You need to have relevant approvals for the activity, but then whenever you're doing um, an activity, whether you're working for a construction company or a big factory or a council, um, you basically have to always do reasonable practical measures, even if it's not specifically in your approval, it's a basic requirement of the law. So it's a really good one to be aware of. And um, when you see sediment fencing and the like around, that's all complying with the GED. So this is just an example of some silt fencing that's quite common to see, and this is a typical sort of building site. In the um, tutorial, in a couple of weeks' time, we'll look at um, a, a pin that's been imposed on a construction company that's got dirt basically in the drain where they haven't complied with the general environmental duty. So that's really common. Okay, so that's our, our overview of the Act. Let's have a think about what we can do as a regulator uh, in terms of enforcement options. So um, under the Act, I mentioned in previous lectures, we can think of it like an enforcement pyramid that we do a whole range of things to, in, to, in, to try and promote compliance through uh, education and warning notices. Do you think education is appropriate in this case? Oh, sorry, I should say the main thing that um, 
there's enforcement guidelines um, for um, the Act, and the main things you look for are the level of harm, the fault, and the remediation effort. Do you think that a warning letter is appropriate in this case? What level of harm occurred? Was it, you know, we're thinking it's material environmental harm. Quite a lot of stuff flowed into the creek. And could they easily have prevented it? Yeah. They just didn't, they weren't monitoring, but they were pretty negligent. So do you reckon a warning notice, a warning letter is enough? I wouldn't say, so, I mean, you as a regulator, you're looking to ensure compliance. You can do a range of administrative things. We could issue them with a notice to clean up the site. Um, let's just think we're there on Monday. They've been working on it for two days. Do you think in a, a notice, do you think we need to give them a clean-up notice? No, they're already doing it. Why do we want to create work for ourselves by giving them a notice to do something that they're already doing voluntarily? So that's not much use. We could also go to court to get an order for them to clean it up, but again, why would we do that? They're already doing it. We could prosecute them, potentially, for causing material environmental harm and you know, look for, a, say, twenty or $30,000 fine. They could take into account to reduce the fine any money that they'd spent on the cleanup, which might already be $30,000. At a lower level, we could give them a PIN, a penalty infringement notice, a ticket for a few thousand dollars, um, and they're unlikely to challenge that. You know, it's a low level, basically, wrap on the knuckles. Um, weighing up what to do, because we've got a lot of options, the harm, we're saying, well, there's material environmental harm here. Um, the fault, is it intentional or just negligent? It's negligent. It's not, they didn't mean to do it. They were just, you know, didn't well manage the site very well. Um, what about the remediation effort? That can push us down the enforcement pyramid. If they've done a good remediation effort, what do you reckon of the remediation effort here? Got all their workers out, responded immediately, that's something that we can take into account. Do you reckon it lowers what we need to do? If we are looking to pr try and promote compliance, most of the cleanup that can be done has already been done. We know that they can take into account the cost that they've incurred in the penalty, so it's going to bring down the penalty we get. We know there's a hell of a lot of work in going to court. Is there much more that we can achieve? What do you reckon is the appropriate option then? Do we take them to court? Do we give them a pin? Do we give them a warning letter? Well, um, back in 1999, I argued for the remediation effort being really outstanding and that we should just give them a pin. We gave them a pin. We also gave um, CSR, the company that had delivered the primer, the pin a pin as well, so we gave it to both entities because they were both parties to the offence. CSR was ballistic about it. They said, we're just the contractor. We're not responsible. We delivered it to site. We followed that, the client's instructions. We said, too bad. Your driver didn't, you know, did, was as you know, negligent as they were. He left the site. He didn't clean it up. He didn't monitor. You delivered it. You're responsible. Um, so they were ballistic about that because they were a large company and they have a whole heap of reporting requirements. Um, so, there's um, enforcement guidelines that basically reflect that. Um, I don't want to dwell on it too much, but I just wanted to bring out the basic concepts in the Act. It's a really important um, that you at least understand the general environmental duty. If you can understand that, it's a great bit of knowledge to take into the workplace for what you're required to do and what your employers are required to do. I just want to look at a couple of um, other aspects of the Act before we wrap up um, and deal with a second problem. Um, Roachdale Landfill, we're going to go here, if you want to come on the field trip um, in a few weeks' time, field trip three, we're going to go out to Roachdale, um, which is about 15 kilometres. We'll only be out there for a few hours. It's a really short field trip. It's really to just look at the site and think about conditions of approval. Um, so it's a big rubbish dump for pretty well the whole of Brisbane. Um, there's some rubbish being delivered. The... Um, EPA, set, the Environmental Protection Act, sets up an approval and licensing regime which is now in Chapter 5. It's integrated into IDAS for prescribed environmentally relevant activities. It also includes mining and petroleum, as we've learnt in previous weeks. And um, for the prescribed ERAs, 
if you carry out a material change of use, so the start of an ERA, the re-establishment of one that's been, or you know, material change in intensity of scale, then um, you, it's accessible development and you're under the IDAS system. Um, the prescribed ERAs are now listed in Schedule 2 of the Environmental Protection Regulations, just as an example, ERA 60 deals with waste disposal and it sets up certain levels of waste disposal and there's different forms of waste, general waste, regulated waste and the like. But basically this is a massive landfill and um, it's ERA 60 and um, we'll look at, I've put the development approval for Rochdale up on the Blackboard site. Here's one of the examples of the conditions that are imposed on it. Um, that the, there must be a collection system for landfill gas, must be installed and maintained to efficiently minimise um, any likelihood of any subsurface migration of landfill gas from the landfill unit and any uncontrolled emission of landfill gas. So that's just an example. The sorts of conditions that are imposed upon it, dealing with odours, release of you know, contaminated stormwater, those sorts of things. So the licensing of ERAs is an important component of the Environmental Protection Act, but you also need to understand the general offence provisions. Another really important component is in Chapter 7, Part 8, which deals with contaminated land. And this sets up a system for dealing with sites that are known to be or may be affected by a hazardous contaminant. And so on, it sets up two registers called the Contaminated Land Register or CLR, an Environmental Management Register or EMR. Um, and sites that are listed on that um, basically, it's, it's commonly um, checked whenever there's a development approval or development application or land is sold um, or bought. Normally, when you buy a house, a good solicitor will do a check of the CLR and the EMR to find out whether it's listed. If it is listed, that's a big problem. Um, and the contaminated land provisions grew out of some bad cases of development of sites that were contaminated but no one, you know, people had forgotten what used to be on the sites and they looked okay and they were developed for houses. We'll look at one of those examples in the last lecture when we look at ethics because um, I'm going to look at um, the council was sued for failing to take reasonable care. Um, so I'll look at um, that site, it's a New South Wales site. But contaminated land provisions are there. Um, it's an important component. I've Put up the, I've done a search of the contaminated land register for the site we're developing at Inskip and I've put that up on the Blackboard site. So the land you're developing isn't listed on the CLR or EMR, so it's not known for um, any contamination. And basically you can do that search, costs about 50 bucks, um, and you know, it's pretty standard sort of search that's done. It's an important register particularly if people are developing you know, places for childcare centres or residential estates, which might have been old farmland you know, or old factory industrial areas, you need to be really careful with it. And you don't want to go out and you know, test everything anew, so this registry system is important. The Act also um, sets up important provisions for executive officer liability, um, and I've given you a handout on that. Basically, there's a whole range of provisions in the... Um, in environmental legislation which says if a company commits an offence, each of the executive officers also commits an offence against the Act. And that's significant because when you're working, you might find that um, you know, the CEO of a company is more concerned about profit um, and they just see environmental management as you know, just costing them. I often get when I've given presentations to boards about environmental laws, they, you see their ears prick up when they say, you can be sued as well because you're an executive officer and you're responsible for ensuring the company complies. Um, there's a defence of what's called due diligence, that they've tried to do all reasonable things to ensure the company complied. And that typically, you'll see on the handout, it typically involves setting up systems, environmental management systems, reporting systems, dealing with you know, proper, um, you know, just proper controls and training of staff. All of those things are stock and standard in any decent company. Um, but for smaller companies, you mightn't find that. But for larger companies, that's how they deal with it. And you guys, if you go out and work for a large company, you know, it, actually um, implementing things like environmental management systems, a lot of your work stems from doing exactly you know, what the company directors need to do to comply with their executive officer liability and due diligence. 
So those are good provisions to be aware of as well. Okay, just wrapping up. In this lecture, we've looked at some key concepts under the Environmental Protection Act. We spent time looking at this bitumen primer and in spill in Townsville. Looked briefly at the approval processes and other tools under the Act. Um, just in wrapping up, in terms of further reading, I know you're working in a group assignment. I want you to focus on that. Um, but if you want to come on the field trip, um, have a look at the um, development approval. We'll be talking more about the conditions. It's available on the Blackboard site. You can have a look at it, have a skim of it, see the sorts of conditions that are commonly imposed. I think it's really useful if you just become at least broadly familiar with the sorts of documents that typically float around for sites. And that's why we're going out to Rochdale to help you understand the management of a site post-approval. Okay, final slide, take home points. The Environmental Protection Act is an advanced piece of environmental protection legislation that's a central component of Queensland's environmental regulatory system. Pollution is not a concept that's generally used in Queensland. Um, environmental harm is wider than pollution and it's the concept that you know, is used throughout the Act. The Environmental Protection Act provides many tools for environmental planning and management, including links to the IDAS system for environmental development activities, as well as mining and petroleum activities. So I've given you those handouts. Um, though you can take those into the exam, so you could expect you know, questions on the general environmental duty, that sort of stuff. I don't generally expect you to remember particular sections that we talk about but I'm giving you that handout, giving you a heads up. I really want you to be aware of particularly that concept. I think it's really an important one to bear in mind. Okay, that's a lecture. Thanks for your attention and I'll see you next week.